and welcome to our show, Brookfield Public Advocate. I'm your host, Bruce Senek. Earlier this year, we had an expert on who provided informative details regarding homeowners and car insurance. Tonight's show deals with a topic we've become all too familiar with since the economic meltdown which started over, the, over five years ago. We'll discuss a major factor in that meltdown, that of home mortgages. I know when I moved to town eight years ago, during what seemed to have been the real estate equivalent to the gold rush, my eyes opened to how things had dramatically changed from the more traditional days of when I bought my first home. I learned both on my end as the mortgage buyer for my new residence and on the other end as the home seller how things had been reduced to what seemed to be a step right up, everyone can buy a home, no money down, qualified or not mentality. Our guest this evening is Denise Panza, a local mortgage broker with Prisma Lending. Denise will offer some insight into this complex area and provide some little known tidbits that may help some certain people with their mortgages. Denise, welcome to our show and thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, Bruce. Denise, please tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I live in Danbury, Connecticut. I'm originally from New York and uh, crossed the border 10 years ago for the purpose of just work. I've always worked for a mortgage company in Connecticut. I have two children. I have Gigi, who is eight. She's in third grade in Danbury schools. And my son, Philip, is a senior at Immaculate. And um, we're doing the whole college searching oh. thing right now. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. Yeah, you know, fun, fun time, but yes. may, maybe a little stressful. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Let's, let's start by, by telling our audience how you originally got into to your line of work. Okay, so I went to college in Boston at Northeastern University and I got a teaching degree. My goal was to go back to Brooklyn, where I'm from, and get a job teaching in the inner city. However, in 1993, I think I just told my age, I, uh, there was a major teaching freeze going on, so there was no jobs available. Um, subbing one day a week was just not going to work. So during college, my father was in the mortgage business, so I guess I've always had a crush on the industry. Um, he had a mortgage company in Long Island, and during the summers I would come back and work for my dad. So it just, that just seemed like the perfect occupation for me to jump into. It was something else that I was passionate about. Since teaching was not going to work, I worked for a mortgage company in, um, in Brookfield, Connecticut, and 17 and a half years later, I'm still here. Never taught a day in my life, but that's okay, because I love what I do. Okay. Well, is it the same company uh, that you're with now? Or the is it second different, one. Different second? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, is, is there, when I, I know when I have uh, moved, as I say, about eight years ago, when I was looking for a mortgage and you know a bridge loan, because I'm selling one home and buying another, uh, I had a little difficulty trying to figure out, you know, the, the landscape, but is there a difference between a mortgage broker, say, at a bank versus a mortgage company? Could you explain that to our, to our viewers? There is. So there's, a mor there's mortgage banks and there's mortgage lenders and there's mortgage brokers. Mortgage lenders and mortgage brokers are more or less the same. Um, they, we, are mortgage, well, actually, so the mortgage, the brokers and the lenders send, uh, we don't hold our paper. We have, you know, an array of products, whereas like a mortgage bank just has one, you know, a particular bank would just have one program for their conventional paper, one program for their FHA paper, one rate for their 30-year fix, one rate for their 15-year. A mortgage lender and a broker have various le uh, lenders and banks they work with, so we just have more um, options. Uh, it does seem... To do, do people, I don't know, pay for that or you just have no. all these arrangements so they really, yes. you have much more of a full service approach? You absolutely do. Yeah. And it's no, there's no additional cost okay. whatsoever. Is, is there a specific training required to become a mortgage broker? There is. So this is, this is, um, this is a department where I feel really strong about. A loan officer at a bank um, does not um, have to deal the same kind of, they're not held to the same licensing and education as a loan officer at a mortgage lender or a broker. Um, a loan officer at a mortgage lender or a broker, they have to initially do 20 hours of education, then they have to do continuing ed every year, eight hours. Um, 
they have to do a uh, national exam, which is really tough. It's like a three-hour exam, and you have to pass it. And then for every state you're licensed in, you have to take a state exam on top of the national exam. So, for example, I'm licensed in Connecticut, in Florida, in Rhode Island, in New Jersey. I had to get fingerprints for every single state. I had to take an exam for every single state. And the exams are pretty intense. Um, if you don't pass them, then you're not, you cannot be a loan officer any, any longer for a mortgage broker or a lender. So I have friends that were in the business who worked with me at you know my same company who failed the exam took it again failed it again to the point where they just couldn't pass it so they had no choice but to leave the broker world and go work for a bank which is a little scary that you know what i mean because they just uh, yeah they're able to just get a job and they don't have to you know. so, so in effect from for me the consumer i'm just looking for a mortgage you have much more rigorous training and and criteria that you have to meet compared to if I go to the bank and yet you still are going to both offer me mortgages. Absolutely. Some banks okay. might you know require that their loan officers do it just because they, they just want that requirement but it's not required. So huh. yeah. Is that a, a state by state thing do you know because you mentioned your license in, in several different states? No so any loan officer that works for a lender or a broker has to do the initial 20 hours, has to do the continuing ed every single year. So my continuing ed's coming up by the end of uh, December. I have to have my eight hours in. Sometimes it's a little bit more for me because I have more states. So some states, you know, Rhode Island will only require two hours. New York will require five. So depending upon how many, you'll have to do it, that continuing it, is, ed. Is there reciprocity between states for no, that? Some of them are, some. But you're always going to do at least that minimum of eight hours, regardless, which is great, I think. That's, I think it's a wonderful thing that we have to do that. Well, you, you answered one of my questions about <laughs> continuing education. Um, I also would, would imagine there are government departments that oversee your field. Is, is that federal and state? There's not or? really a federal one. There's a consumer protection agency that kind of oversees the whole mortgage thing now. And I mean, it's, you know, they're really doing a great job. I mean, you know, our industry has changed, uh, has done 180, which is great. It, need, it needed to have. Um, and then, um, and then just the individual banking departments. So Connecticut will have their own, you know, set of rules and regulations, and will monitor. And then you know, Florida and you know, so forth. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I I know when I um, when I first moved here a, a couple of years after they started up the Brookfield Chamber of Commerce. So I for a couple of years belonged to the Brookfield Chamber. Um, and then after that, I, I moved to the New Milford Chamber of Commerce, and then uh, had some some things uh, take me a little bit of a different direction, but. Uh, again, this being before the meltdown, uh, and when I was members of both the, the chambers, I would say the overwhelming, the, the majority of members were, seemed to either be bankers, mortgage brokers, and realtors. Uh, with the meltdown, of course, that number is, uh, that membership, a lot of that membership has disappeared. I wonder, you know, if you have some thoughts that you might share with us on, again, not to point fingers or, or blame, but it, it just seemed everybody and their brother was a mortgage broker at, at one point. That's a true story. So I think two things happened. Well, well, first, the whole, you know, Wall Street basically was, you know, selling these mortgages on the secondary market and making lots and lots of money. The A paper ran out, and they were like, okay, we need more loans. So I think it, the focus went to um, quality, quantity as opposed to quality. And so then the guidelines changed. The, the lenders and the banks were saying, okay, so now, so much for the 700 credit score borrowers, let's take the 500 credit score borrowers, and then let's take the borrowers who really can't verify their income, and the, just the guidelines loosened up. Um, so then pretty much everybody and their mother could get a mortgage, and then everybody and their mother wanted to get into the mortgage business because you were more or less at that point, you were just a glorified order taker. So you had people who were, you know, farmers and bartenders and, you know, hairdressers doing perms yesterday, and now all of a sudden they're making decisions on someone's, you know, half a million dollar purchase of their home which is a little scary and that's kind of what I see what happened so you had everybody doing these mortgages um, and now obviously things have changed and now you have to actually you know have knowledge of the industry and in order to work in the industry yeah which well, is a good um, thing. My, my career is, has been for as a insurance and financial advisor and I actually um, back in the 90s and even early part of this uh, uh, or in the 2000s, uh, have some clients that uh, one is retired, um, and, but the other mortgage people, um, they're, they're long gone. And, you know, very nice individuals, but I was sort of surprised um, 
I know I want to deal with professionals uh, in my end, and, and I hope that people want to deal with professionals when they come to me. And it was just, it really was kind of uh, a li little scary, um, so some of the people that were in the field. Do you have any horror stories? Um, I know we don't want to dwell, uh, <laughs> but still, of, of people that maybe had had some, a bad experience that then needed to come to you, and maybe you were the uh, mortgage doctor that were able to fix them up? I. I, I think most of the time when, when people, I get the call in the 11th hour that, you know, the, the next guy dropped the ball and, oh, they thought they were closing tomorrow on their new home and they're not, I think still comes from, sometimes it comes from the larger banks only because, um, and not, not saying that because they're not, you know, um, they don't have the same education and knowledge that we do, but that I think they, um, what happens with the, with the larger banks is they're just so busy and they take these applications on and initially it's like give me your W-2s, give me your pay stubs, fill out the application, give me the money for the appraisal and then fast forward 30, 45 days later the underwriter gets it and the underwriter's like um, yeah no you don't qualify and they turn it down and that's what kind of happens whereas I think with the mortgage brokers and, and well some, I mean most of us, a loan officer you initially when you take the application on that's when you look at it, everything right then and there before you even make a decision or before you even take any of their money and decide if this person has you know a, um, you know, a home for their loan. Kind of like a pre-qualification? Right, so I think some of the pre-quals are, are a little e easy going. Yeah. Also, too, though, with the horror stories, I think, you know, again, going to a bank, they have, you know, one requirement. Their income to debt ratio is one number. You know, they're, they have certain guidelines. You need, you know, this, this, and this. Whereas a mortgage broker, because I deal with 25 lenders, I mean, some of the programs that my lenders offer are, they, I mean, they, some of them are portfolio lenders. So it's not like they're doing subprime paper anymore, but they say, you know what, um, I'm going to look at the primary wage earner's credit score. As, so if you have a husband and wife and the husband um, has a 700 credit score and the wife who's maybe a homemaker has a 600 score for whatever reason, um, in the normal world, you would base their rate on the lower score. But for some of my lenders, you know, some of the investors that are out there, not so much mine, but some of the investors that are out there and available to brokers um, will um, have, have really niche products that they're just like, you know what, this is the guy who makes the money, this is what his score is, so we're going to discount, you know, the wife's credit score. There's just so many, you know, options out there. Yeah, and <clears throat> that's, that's where the professionalism, I think, needs to come in and just be able to discern instead of just, you know, kind of go along the assembly line, maybe. Exactly. That's at least what's what it sounds like. Right. Uh, can, can you speak to, um, in my professional life as, a, as an advisor, as I mentioned earlier, I have um, many clients with good credit, uh, good credit scores, good risks, et cetera, that have had a lot of problems refinancing. Um, I can think of literally about three or four in the last few months that uh, have kind of gone through this. Is there, uh, you know, I don't, I, again, I know you don't know the specifics, but um, is this just uh, the world we're in now that it's much more difficult or the, the uh, they don't want to, banks don't want to refinance at a, from a higher interest rate or? No, I don't think so. I think I think that there are so many programs out there. Um, I just think that that's why it's important to just not stop at the first call. So when if you call one person, one particular lender, and they say we can't do anything for you, I definitely think you need to call you know at least one or two others because again, if you're if you call just that one individual who has that one program, you're totally excluding yourself from all the other options that are out there. There's programs now where if you're upside down on your house, you still qualify for the same rate as everybody else. The HART program is a home affordable. Um, so your house could be worth, I'll do simple math, uh, $100,000 or let's say your house is worth one hundred, dollars and you owe two hundred. dollars You can still refi right now. You don't need an appraisal. You can still get the same rate as everybody else on the conforming paper, Fannie and Freddie. Um, people who have, you know, the only, there's, there's even programs out there for no income verification. You know, it's different than the still? no income verification <laughs> back in the day where, hi, I work at McDonald's, I make $8 an hour, and I'm not verifying my income, and I want to buy a half a million dollar house. But now, there's no income verifications, and they're true, no, I mean, it's for a self-employed borrower only. You can't be on fixed income, which is scary, because back in the day, you could be on fixed income and do a no income verification loan, which is silly. Um, if you're a self-employed borrower, and the loan to values are a little different, so you know it's not 100% financing, but maybe you put down 35% as opposed to um, 
and, and you just have to show assets. So basically they're saying, you know what, if you have all this money in the bank, consistently every month it looks like you make this kind of money and your loan to value is so low that you're a great risk and they still, still, we still write those kind of loans. They still exist out there, which is nice. Huh. So, so someone actually who owes more on their home, they... They can refinance do, and take advantage. Do, now that's news to me. Is that news to most people? Or it is just that, is came that out, known out there? Like or? maybe six months ago, HARP, yeah. um, Home Affordable Refi Program, which is great so that everyone can take advantage of these rates that are in the threes right now. So equity, equity is, uh, can be, is, is not an issue at all. Huh. Credit scores, you know, they don't have to be amazing. They can be in the 600s. Um, perfect mortgage history. They even allow for a one times 30. So, yeah, it's still, it's, it's a great program. What's a one times 30? Oh, one times 30, I'm sorry, a 30 day late on their mortgage. They can still oh, qualify oh, okay. for this. Because oh, okay. ultimately it's a win-win situation. If someone's paying their mortgage on time and their rate is 6% from a few years ago and they can refinance at three, uh, it's, you know, only good's gonna come of it. And what's gonna, ha I mean, the banks are probably looking at it, whereas this person is so upside down in their house, they could easily walk, walk away, away tomorrow. Here's another option to say, you know what, stay in your home, we're gonna lower your rate, lower your payment, and it's, it's, it's pretty much off for, as long as their loan is owned by Fannie or Freddie, then they can qualify for the program most of the time. Doing something like that, does that, you know, does that have an effect on their credit score? Or Absolutely anything? not. It's a true refi. It's not like doing a, um, uh, a rate mod that people were doing every day. Those expensive rate mods where you basically had to stop making your payment and then the bank would say, okay, we'll give you a, you know, 3% rate for the next five years. This is a true refi. It's coming, it's right from Fannie and Freddie. Huh. It's a conforming loan product. Now, in, in preparing for today's show, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit, and, and you mentioned some some programs that, uh, you know, well, we're not going to, you know, get into specifics type of thing, but um, you mentioned some programs. I think you mentioned um, VA loans and, and a whole series, you know, could you, could you talk to that a little bit, some of the general types of, of, okay. of uh, mortgages that are out there? So USDA loan, United States Department of Agriculture, they have a program. It's been around forever and ever. It's 100% financing. Um, it's a great rate, very little mortgage insurance, so they're putting down, typically if you don't put down 20%, you're paying mortgage insurance. This is a very, very tiny percentage every month. Um, it is uh, income-based, so you have to, like say in Fairfield County, make less than $115,000, I think. Um, and uh, you can, it's, it's not in every town, so Brookfield's eligible, Danbury isn't, New Milford is, Waterbury isn't more, the, you know, not this urban, not the cities are not eligible. But that's a great program that people don't realize that they truly can buy a house with no money down. I know people think like, oh, well, if they're not putting any money down, that's so high risk. But if you think about the cost of rent, so somebody's paying, you know, $2,000 a month in rent, they can clearly make their payment. Maybe they're just cash poor. They just can't seem to save. They have kids or what have you. Um, they can buy a house, $200,000 home, taxes, $4,000 a year, and their mortgage pay pay payment between principal, interest, taxes, and insurance Insurance and mortgage insurance could be 1600 so they're still huh. they're ahead of the game they have pride in home ownership they have a tax write-off and their payment is less than their rent so that's a beautiful program it sure is <laughs> so then there's VA which is veteran loans another hundred percent program hundred percent financing which a lot of people even reservists qualify for if they've been in the reserves for so many years but there are like thousands and hundreds and I don't maybe millions millions of, of veterans who have not taken advantage of this. Some don't even know that they qualify for it, but they can buy a home, a single family home, a condo, a multi-family home with no money down, which is amazing. Um, FHA is a great product. Again, your credit scores can go down to 620 and you can buy a house with three and a half percent down um, and get an amazing rate as low as you know, the low threes on a 30 year fix, which is great. Yeah. And, and you mentioned earlier mortgage insurance. Um, now, in the, I'm in the um, life insurance side of it, not the property casualty, but when we talk mortgage insurance, mortgage insurance being um, if, if one of the uh, owners dies, then the mortgage is paid off. But, of course, uh, mortgage insurance you're referring to is different. Can you, can you tell the folks That's quickly the about that? That's the bank's coverage. That's their insurance that if you default, we've collected some money and we have a cushion. On FHA, they pay, there's a lump sum that you pay up front, which is 1.75 of the, the loan amount. So if someone's buying a $100,000 house, FHA is saying, okay, we're going to let you buy this house for 3.5% down, but we're going to take seventeen fifty and we're going to finance it above and beyond the purchase price just as our little cushion. It's their cushion. It has, doesn't benefit the buyer whatsoever. Right. And that, that's a one-time deal. It's a one-time deal on FHA, but it's also monthly. So on, on conforming paper, it's a monthly fee every month that they would pay. 
Oh. And it, it drops off automatically once they get to that 78.9 loan to value mark. Oh, okay. Right. Got you. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end of the show. I don't know if there are any other examples um, you know, that you might want to uh, provide for our, our viewers or um, any more information. I think reverse mortgages are, are something that are, uh, you know, an individual 62 years old, they, I mean, uh, you can be in, so there could be senior citizens out there who are own their home and they're in foreclosure and people don't realize that you can do a reverse mortgage. They do not have to credit qualify. Um, they just have to have equity in their home and be at least 62 years of age. It's a great product. I gave one to my mother on her 62nd birthday because for me, she had a lot of equity in her home. My brothers and I were not focusing on the equity. We just wanted to know that mom um, got she got an initial uh, sum of money. You can you can structure it. It's a really it's a really wonderful loan. You can structure it so that you get a lump sum. You can go on cruises every year. You can do improvements to your house, or <laughs> you can structure it that you get a monthly payment every single month for the rest of your life. Okay. It's, a, it's just another cool okay. program. So, and I would imagine that um, contacting you know a, a mortgage broker that has all these different companies is better than I've seen Robert Wagner on TV doing <laughs> commercials. Um, yes. Probably a little bit more uh, professional than, than contacting right. th them. Okay. Agreed. Um, as I say, we're getting close to the end here. Is there any one last thing that you'd like to leave with our audience tonight? Just that, if you call one individual and you get an answer that says no, I just I I just want people to you know believe that there are programs out there and that loans are being written every day and it's so important to call somebody else who has a whole another array of options because you're just, you're just selling, you, there's just there's options there's yeah. options out there and loans are happening people are closing loans every day there's amazing programs out there okay well that, that, that's great because it sounds reading the the, the news and, and hearing the news on TV it sounds like you know no one's buying no one's selling no mm -hmm. one's doing anything Not and true. you make it sound like you know there may be in a different stratosphere or something. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to wrap up our show now. Uh, again, I'd like to thank tonight's special guest, Denise Panza of Prisma Lending. If uh, any of the viewers or folks have questions regarding mortgages, please contact me and I can um, forward them to Denise. I'm sure she'd be uh, happy to, to answer them for you. I want to remind our viewers again that our air dates on Charter Channel 21 are Mondays at 4.30 and Thursdays at 7.30. I'm sorry, Thursdays at 7 p.m. We also post segments up on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you, whether it be comments on uh, the current show or, or uh, past shows uh, or to ideas or topics that you'd like to see for future shows uh, or guests that you'd like to see. And you can contact us at brookfieldpublicadvocate at yahoo.com. Again, thanks for watching and good night.